Uh, my name's Dr. Paul Richardson, and I'm the uh, Director of Clinical Research at the Jerome Lipper Multiple Myeloma Center at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts, and I also serve as the R.J. Corman Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. It's my privilege to be here at the ASCO 2019 meeting uh, and to share with you some of the highlights um, of the meeting uh, as they applied, of course, to multiple myeloma. And it was really a pleasure to be part of a, a Sunday morning session that was packed with exciting news in myeloma. Uh, we started with a, a very interesting session on smoldering disease, on how we're continuing to revise the risk criteria to better understand in the smoldering space who is true high risk, who is intermediate and who is low. And why this became or is so important is because there was a really, I think, very uh, uh, thought-provoking study presented by Dr. Sagalonio on behalf of ECOG and also representing contributions from uh, the other groups, Alliance and SWOG, where Saga showed very nicely the impact of lenalidomide as a single agent used in high to intermediate risk patients in the smoldering setting. And what he showed, which I thought was so interesting, was that clear clinical benefit is apparent in the high-risk group, whereas in the intermediate to low-risk group, and there were a small number of low-risk patients enrolled in the trial, um, that really there was no evidence of clinical benefit for lenalidomide in these groups of patients, although there clearly was in high-risk. So what one was left with the impression was, was that the high-risk group of patients really constitute an area that we should be further evaluating and considering early intervention Certainly clinical trials continue in this area and they are likely remain a gold standard approach with careful observation. Um, in terms of clinical trials in the space that also address the smoldering area, it's important to note we already have a previous randomized phase three trial from our Spanish colleagues showing not only PFS benefit but also survival benefit, but in patients who would be considered ultra high risk and or even active by modern criteria. So taken together, these two phase three studies in my view strongly support a strategy of intervention in smoldering myeloma. The question is, who should get what? Should low-risk, intermediate-risk patients be fundamentally observed, considered for clinical trials, and, and, and evaluated accordingly? And should now high-risk patients actually receive active treatment? I think because in this particular ECOG trial, we're still awaiting survival data, and at the same time, we did see that in the lenalidomide-treated patients, there was a 50% discontinuation rate in terms of the use of lenalidomide, some caution has to be adopted in this approach. Having said that, it's very clear to me that the PFS benefit seen in favor of lenalidomide monotherapy was very compelling. So I think going forward, more research needed, further categorization of um, risk, but clearly a more proactive approach to the management of smoldering disease, in my view, um, is warranted. And certainly in our own practice, clinical trials remain a top priority as we go forward. And in that same context, there was a very compelling presentation uh, from Dr. Dr. Francesca Gay, in which she showed the updated results of the Forte trial, uh, in which she was able to demonstrate really, I think, important data at last year's ASH. Here she showed that the combination of KCD plus transplant um, actually, interestingly, uh, did not perform as well as KRD plus transplant and fascinatingly didn't perform as well as KRD without transplant, but transplant kept in reserve. It did appear on that initial analysis that KRD plus transplant was essentially equivalent to KRD with transplant kept in reserve. But what was so exciting about her presentation today was that she was able to look at high risk patients and distinguish that in those at least, perhaps transplant did convey benefit because there was a lower rate of early relapse in that particular cohort. However, I think it's very, we have to be very careful here because progression-free survival data are not yet available. And what's very important to realize is that in these high-risk patients, they were randomized to receive lenalidomide maintenance or lenalidomide and carfilzomib. And we do not know what they were assigned to in maintenance as, as in, in, in the context of these subsequent relapses. And until we know that, I think it's difficult to draw firm conclusions. But what was clear to me is that this new approach to tailoring the use of transplant in newly diagnosed patients and adapting our therapy to meet uh, a, a risk really makes sense. And I, I thought it was an excellent presentation. It also echoed very nicely on superb work presented by Dr. Philippe Moreau, looking at the role of daratumumab in transplant-eligible patients, and in fact in patients who went on to transplant 
uh, in the setting of the large randomized phase three, t three trial he presented, the largest of its kind. I was particularly struck by how successful daratumumab was in improving overall quality and depth of response. And in that same setting, I think the advent of antibodies into this space is, is particularly exciting. And I think it once again moves the needle and changes the way we view the treatment of myeloma. My own view is that the three drug platforms of a proteasome inhibitor, an imid, and steroid can now be added to rationally with an antibody. CD38 targeting making the most sense of the, of, the, of the present time based upon randomized high level evidence. And this may in fact dramatically improve the outcome for our patients going forward. In the remainder of the session, it was particularly interesting to see how daratumumab can now be safely given subcutaneously and effectively, which was particularly good for patients. And finally, there was some very compelling data from Dr. Sagalonio looking at a brand new cell mod, 220 is its number. And this particular uh, drug has also a new name, Iberidamide, I think is I'm pronouncing it properly, Iber for short. And basically, um, this was really interesting data where in pomalidomide and lenalidomide refractory patients, 220 had clear activity and an excellent safety profile to date. So I think that molecule is going to be very promising. And as we think about other molecules that are shortly behind it, we can be looking to a whole new generation of imid-like drugs or so-called cell mods, which may be transformative. The final presentation uh, was from our colleagues in Germany looking at this very exciting new bite uh, called AMG420. The results from this trial were particularly compelling, I thought, where at the active dose, uh, a high response rate was seen, 70%. The majority of these responses were complete responses. And whilst the side effect profile clearly needs uh, uh, some attention, and there was in fact some treatment-related mortality, I think at the same time, um, we clearly have a signal from this approach that it may be highly efficacious, and clearly further studies are needed. So going forward, I think in the myeloma space, we have real progress in the smoldering area. We have further refinement and adaptation in the transplant area. We have the huge impact of antibodies. And we also have now new imid-like drugs, cell mods, that are clearly showing their safety and early promise in terms of efficacy. And finally, even more excitement on cellular therapy platforms that may further augment our ability to improve outcome.